Well, good morning. Happy Easter. My name is Matt Van Cleve. I'm the teaching pastor here at Blue Oaks. And if this is your first time in church uh, for a long time, or maybe this is your first time here, I just want to extend a special welcome to you. And I realize that you may be here because your relatives bribed you at lunch, or maybe someone told you that you might meet someone cute. Uh, whatever the reason is, we're just glad you're here today. And uh, we'll, today we start our teaching series, Stories That Stick. Uh, this is a, a teaching series on the stories that Jesus told. Uh, these are stories told by the smartest man who ever lived. And, uh, you know, in our society, the problem with hanging around real smart people is they always work real hard to let you know how smart they are, right? There's an old story about Albert Einstein and his chauffeur. Uh, in Einstein's early years, he would travel around the country giving a lecture and his Chauffeur was the one person who was with him all the time. And so the chauffeur heard him give this lecture every night. He heard it like a hundred times, the same lecture over and over, and he kind of got sick of it after a while. And finally, he said to Einstein, I've heard you give this lecture so many times, I think I could give it myself. And so Einstein challenged him to give it a shot at their next stop. So they agreed to switch roles, and the next night, the chauffeur pretended to be Einstein, and Einstein dressed up as a chauffeur. The chauffeur made it all the way through the lecture, and everything went well until they came to the end. There was a Q&A time that they had forgotten about. Someone stood up and asked a complex question about quantum physics. And the chauffeur stood there for a moment, and then he said, you know, that question is so easy, I'm going to give it to my chauffeur to answer it. <laughs> <clears throat> Sometimes when you hang around real smart people, they work real hard to let you know how smart they are. <clears throat> now today we begin this series based on the teachings of Jesus, who was the smartest man who ever walked the face of the earth. And people who listened to him teach were amazed by how much he knew and that he was just right about everything. Uh, he was brilliant. But what's amazing about him is with a mind like that, he never showed off. He never said anything to impress people with his brilliance. Uh, his desire simply was that everyone would learn and live in the truth, and he just longed for that. And so, of course, he gave considerable thought to his method of teaching. How was he going to teach in a way that would engage great minds, highly intellectual people, as well as some of the most uneducated people? Well, the primary method he chose for teaching was to tell stories. In fact, about a third of the stories, or a third of his words that are recorded in Scripture are stories. Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples who spent several years with him, said in Matthew 13, 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything, anything to them without using a parable. A parable is a story. And between Matthew, the tax collector, and Luke, the doctor, and Matthew and Luke, the Gospels, there are 40 parables, uh, and there are 20 more of what might be called mini-parables. These stories are designed to make a truth available to everyone. In fact, we get our word parable from a Greek word. It's a compound word, parabolain. It's taken from two words. Uh, balain, which means to throw, and para, which is alongside of. Uh, to throw alongside of. And the idea of a parable is that Jesus would take an occurrence from everyday life, something that everyone was familiar with, and he would throw it alongside a spiritual truth so that people could learn about God and his ways. Jesus would say, you ever see a woman desperately searching for a lost coin? Ever see a shepherd desperately searching for lost sheep? Well, then you understand God's heart for people who get lost. He would tell stories about corrupt judges and poor widows and buried treasures and lazy employees and bad debts and noisy neighbors and people just got it, and they would flock to him. Jesus taught in a way that these stories just stuck with people. And for 2,000 years now, these stories have stretched the greatest minds, and they've fed the most simple ones. They've pierced the hardest hearts, and they've shaped the greatest souls that have walked the face of the earth. And we're devoting ourselves to these stories over the next couple months. And I have to say, I am more excited about this teaching series than I am about, than I have been about anything I've ever taught. Uh, this is my excited face. Um, 
we are going to hear the very heart of what Jesus taught. And he's going to be our teacher, and he's going to stretch our minds, and he's going to pierce our hearts, and he's going to shape our souls. And I believe if you sign on for this series, by the end of it, you will know God better than you've ever known him. And you'll love God more than you've ever loved him, and you'll live more faithfully than you've ever lived before. This is the heart of what Jesus taught. And we're going to start today by looking at a very important parable. And I need you to know up front that this is a heavy parable. It's a heavy story. I'm going to talk today about a place that does not get talked about very often. It's generally quite uh, considered quite uh, impolite to even bring it up in our day. It's described in imagery that's dark and bleak. Uh, no one thinks they're going to end up in this place, but people do. Uh, we're going to talk today about Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> if you're from Tracy, please uh, forgive me. I just want to confess up front. Don't send me any hate mail, hate email or anything. The parable that we're going to look at today is about life and death. And it's about what happens just a few minutes after you die. And if you have your Bible and you want to follow along, we'll be in Luke 16 today. In preparation for this message, I did some research on the funeral industry. Uh, an interesting truth about us is that we don't like to think much about death, but we spend a lot of money when it actually happens. I read a market analysis by an NBA in the coffin business, and he's very optimistic because of the increased number of people who will die in the United States over the next uh, 30 years. He said that the forecast for the growth in the deceased, which is kind of an interesting phrase, continues each decade peaking at 18.1% between the years 2030 and 2040. And because the boomer generation wants to go out in style, uh, one of the growing trends is something called the designer casket. And these can range up to like $20,000. They have university caskets that can be made in the colors of your alma mater. Like you can get your school logo on your casket if you want. They actually sold these caskets at an Ohio State homecoming game. When they say homecoming at Ohio State, they really mean homecoming. <laughs> I don't know that there's ever been a culture that has spent more money on death or less time and attention on what comes after death. And that hasn't always been the case for us. You know, for many generations, when parents would tuck their children in at night, they would have them say a little prayer. Many of you know this prayer. If you do, say it with me. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake... I pray the Lord my soul to take. It's kind of a nice way to send your kids off to bed. Good night. Hope to see you in the morning. <laughs> Hope you don't die in your sleep. There's actually a second verse to that prayer. Our days begin with trouble here. Our life is but a span. But cruel death is always near. So frail a thing is man. Good night. Sweet dreams. <laughs> And people used to teach their kids that prayer because people wanted their children to know that death is real. But it's not the end. It's not the end. There's another way to think about death. If you walk through a cemetery, you can learn what people think about death by reading some of the epitaphs. Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not has a collection of unusual epitaphs from all across the country, uh, from tombstones all over. Uh, one, one of them is in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and it says... Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake. He stepped on the gas instead of the brake. <laughs> There's a tombstone of a hypochondriac that simply says, I told you I was sick. <laughs> Does anyone recognize the name Mel Blanc? He was a voice behind all the cartoon characters in the Looney Tunes. And at the end of every movie, you would see Porky Pig come on screen, and he would always say the same thing. Abadi, abadi, abadi. That's all, folks. Do you know what his family put on his tombstone? That's all, folks. So here's a question for us today. Is that all, folks? Does death mean the show is over? Or is it possible that somewhere the real show is just beginning? One of the most profound books of the last century was written by a man named Ernest Becker. It's called The, Den the Denial of Death. Becker says that his, his, the thesis of his books is, book is this, we arrange our lives around ignoring or avoiding or oppressing the most irrefutable fact in the whole world, which is I'm going to die. You're going to die. Becker says that the avoidance or the denial of death is the mainspring of human activity. 
we arrange our lives around trying to be really busy and distracted from this truth because it's too big for us. We're all going to die. We don't like to think about that, but it's true. Someone like famous actor and model Paul Walker dies at age 40 in a car accident. Or someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman dies at age 46. They die suddenly, and we realize we're all going to die one day. Life has an ending point. And we get this reality check reminding us that we better give some serious thought to what happens just minutes after we die. We better be prepared for it. Well, today we're going to look at a story Jesus tells about what happens just a few minutes after we die. It's in Luke 16. And when Jesus began telling this story, the crowd had no idea what he was about to tell them. He had no idea where he was going. They had no idea where he was going with the story. And in this story, he addresses quite graphically some of the questions that people have about life and death and about what happens just a few minutes after we die. And then he talks about some implications of knowing what happens just a few minutes after we die. If you look at uh, Luke 16, starting at verse 19, Jesus says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So we have this beggar who would lie outside the gate of this rich man's estate, hoping and praying that maybe some of the hired help would give him uh, some leftovers of the fine food that they were eating. This beggar was so poor he couldn't afford to see a doctor and his body was decaying. He was in such bad shape that the dogs of the city would come around and they would lick his wounds. This beggar was named Lazarus. The name Lazarus means God has helped. But there's no indication that this affluent guy has ever helped. Remember, the listeners now have no idea where this story is going. And all of a sudden, Jesus surprises them with the punchline of the story. The punchline is that both of these guys die. They both die on the same day at the same time. In Luke uh, 16, verse 22, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Jesus is talking about heaven here. The rich man also died and was buried. Even with his wealth, he couldn't avoid death. Uh, They both died, they're both buried, and they both must face eternity. And at this point, Jesus' listeners understood exactly what he was trying to tell them. He was trying to tell them that no matter who you are, no one is going to escape death. It's an inevitable chasm that we all must face. Death is an inevitable chasm that we all must cross. And so here's the question at this point. What happens just a few minutes after you die? What really happens? From this parable, I want to suggest three things. Number one, you will be wide awake just moments after you die. You will be. Number two, you will be filled with either tremendous gratitude or enormous regret. You'll be, you'll, you will not be neutral. There will be no middle ground, either tremendous gratitude or enormous regret. And number three, you will be able to reflect back on your life with great clarity. Let me just dig into these three points. First, you will be wide awake. In this parable, both the rich man and Lazarus immediately woke up on the other side. There is no delay in that. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a thief dying on the cross next to him. And Jesus was dying for the sins of that thief on the cross. He was dying for your sins and my sins. And Jesus said to the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. There was no delay. Not years from now, but this day. There's no delay. There wasn't, wasn't about someday. It was about today. When you die, your spirit immediately goes to the other side. And so minutes after you die, you're awake. And then second, you will be filled with either tremendous gratitude or enormous regret. You will not be neutral. And I want to spend most of our time on this point. There was a stunning reversal for this rich man and Lazarus on the other side. If you look at what Jesus is saying, starting at verse 22 again, the time came when the beggar died and the angels came to carry him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this this fire. Now before you draw the wrong conclusion here, this man's wealth was not his problem. He didn't go to hell because of his affluence. 
We find that in this text that Lazarus is in heaven next to Abraham, and Abraham was one of the most affluent people in the Old Testament. It didn't keep him out of heaven. And the problem of this rich man was he never responded to God in this life. He never responded to God's purposes for his life. The guy's problem was throughout his life, he never thought of anyone but himself, including God. His problem was he wasn't prepared for death. And Jesus asked the question in Mark 8, 36, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? I'm telling you, if you see, you, you see it in the story, when you wake up on the other side of eternity, you're going to be filled with either tremendous gratitude for where you are or enormous regret. There will be no middle ground. This is a unique passage because it's the only passage that describes for us with words uh, that uh, describe the words and the thoughts and the feelings and the emotions and the experience of someone in hell. A Gallup poll found that 78% of Americans believe in heaven and 78% of Americans believe that there's a good or excellent chance that they're going to go to heaven. 60% of Americans believe in hell and 4% believe that they have a good or excellent chance of going there. <laughs> now, those of you who know me know I'm not like a hellfire and brimstone preacher, uh, but you know that I'm committed to telling you the truth, even when it's not pleasant. And because the topic of hell is in this passage, I need to talk to you about something for a few minutes that I take very little pleasure in talking to you about. And some people wonder, you know, what is hell like? And it's interesting that a lot of people get their picture of hell from cartoons in our day. I saw one a while ago. It was a split view of heaven and hell. They both looked exactly the same except for one detail. In both pictures, there's large crowds of people and everyone's going through a gate. Uh, in the heaven one, someone was saying, welcome to heaven, here's your harp. In the hell one, someone was saying, welcome to hell, here's your accordion. <laughs> and a lot of people just get their picture uh, of heaven and hell from that kind of stuff. A kind of corollary picture is, uh, wouldn't it be better to be in hell with my friends than in heaven with a bunch of weird people? <laughs> people don't put it exactly that way, but that's kind of the question. The picture they have is something like this. You know, hell may be dark and so on, but at least there's no rules or Bibles, and I'm free to do whatever I want. Kind of like an eternal Bud Light commercial. Now, this is very important. You can only understand the tragedy of hell against the backdrop of the wonder of heaven. Heaven will be perfect, uninterrupted community with God and people, complete and ultimate love and joy. It's that for, for which you were made, and, and there you will finally fully be the person that God created you to be. I mean, you take the best day of your life when everything on your schedule gets done perfectly and, you know, you got done more than you've ever thought you would ever get done. Your relationships are exactly the way that you want them to be. It gets better. I mean, you take the best day that you've ever had on this earth and it doesn't compare to a day in heaven. You know, whenever joy gets communicated in things like Bud Light commercials, those kinds of commercials appeal to our sense of brotherhood and, and love and laughter and zest to be alive. And these are all good gifts, but they have been distorted by sin in this world. And they will one day either be utterly redeemed and fulfilled in heaven, or they will one day be completely distorted and lost in hell. There's no community in hell. One of the primary images in the Bible for hell is the image of being excluded from community. For instance, Jesus tells a parable of the wedding banquet. Uh, there's this picture of community and intimacy, and those who are in hell are pictured as being outside of the wedding banquet. The doors are shut. They're outside of community. I just want to point out three things that we learn about hell in this parable. One is, hell is a place of enormous discomfort. The rich man says, I am in an agony in this fire. And Jesus describes hell in Mark 9, 43, as a fire that is not quenched. Other writers of Scripture use terms like death and outer darkness and bottomless pit to describe hell. Whatever hell is like, Jesus uses the absolute worst terms that he had available to him in order to describe it. Second, hell is a place of memory. If you look at verse 25, but Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good gifts, your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Abraham tells the rich man to remember his lifetime. 
And the rich man looked over and saw Lazarus in perfect comfort in heaven, and he remembered how he used to be so wrapped up in his own life and in his own wealth that he walked right by this person in need every day. This person suffering with sores who is starving to death right outside of his own home. He could remember. And not only is it a place of torture and memory, according to this text, hell is irreversible. In verse 26, Abraham says, And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm. A great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. There are no reversals. There's a a finality about what happens just minutes after you die. And for anyone in hell, there is going to be enormous regret over the missed opportunities that they had during this lifetime to seek God and to find God and to respond to God and to get right with God while they had the opportunity to do it on this side. Some people say they can't believe or understand that God would actually send people to hell. And I need you to hear me say this. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We send ourselves there. God sent his only son so that no one would have to go there. Jesus gave his lifeblood on the cross so that everyone could be saved from that place. That's why we celebrate the death of Christ on the cross. That's why we celebrate Easter, the resurrection. You know, if you're exploring Christianity, and this is a question that maybe you're struggling with, I want to encourage you to read a book by a former atheist who was uh, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, He addresses this issue, and he addresses a number of other issues that skeptics have uh, in his book, A Case for Faith. And we have copies of this book at the new guest area. If you want to grab one on your way out, uh, we'd love to give you a copy for free if this is something that you want to study further. But I think what you'll learn is if a person like this rich man in this story ends up in hell, it's not because God sent him there. It's because this person rejects all of God's efforts to keep him away from that place in this lifetime. If someone is there, it's not because of what God has done. It's in spite of what God has done. I believe the Bible is very clear on this. And I hope if you don't take anything else away today, I hope you take this away with you. There is no one on this earth, not the most earnest, passionate person who wants people, all people, to spend an eternity in heaven with God one one millionth as much as God does. Look at John 3, 17. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, In the context of asking for prayer for all those who are in authority, he says this, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. No one wants people to spend an eternity in heaven with God one one millionth as much as God does himself. And God paid the ultimate price so that people could be saved from hell. You know, we have a warning sometimes for people. If we really don't want someone to do something, if we're like dead set against it, we'll say, you will do that over my dead body. Well, Jesus says any member of the human race is going to have to go to hell over my dead body. He says the only way that you're going to get there if you want hell is you have to walk all the way around the cross. The cross is God's ultimate expression, the ultimate price paid so that all human beings can spend an eternity in heaven. Which brings us to the second point, uh, the second half of this point. The Bible is clear that for those who respond to God's amazing grace through his son, their experience just after they die will be filled with just tremendous gratitude. Jesus used terms to describe heaven that defy imagination. Uh, The Apostle Paul says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I think the Apostle Paul said this for those of us who get confused about heaven. I think some people think that heaven is just going to be like this ultimate retirement village. I was talking to someone who asked me if there was going to be golf in heaven. And his thought was, you know, I can't be happy without golf. And since heaven is a place where I'll be happy, there must be golf in heaven, right? And I explained to him that in heaven, we know there will be no lying, swearing, or cheating. So how could golf be there? (laughs) 
Now, people have questions about heaven. They, they wonder, will we have bodies in heaven? And the answer is yes. But we will all get extreme makeovers by the great physician, God himself. I mean, if you think about it, after Jesus was resurrected, the disciples saw the nail prints in his hand. They saw the wound in his side. But his body was different at that point. He had a body, but it was different. He was a resurrected body. He could transcend time and space in that body. It was like a new, improved body. He ascended into heaven in the presence of his disciples with that body. Now, my understanding of Scripture is that when you die, your soul, your true self, who you really are, immediately goes to be with God on the other side. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you don't get your body at that point. Uh, the Bible indicates that the resurrection of the body will take place at a point in the future. However, when you die, your spirit, your true self, immediately goes to be in the presence of the Lord. You get to be with the Lord, but your body goes into the ground. If you think about it, when Jesus died, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he went to be the Father. And then three days later, he was resurrected with a different body. He came out of the grave with a resurrected body. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.14, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Our bodies are going to be changed. God will give us new bodies with no pain or disease or death, no cancer, no broken bones, no slim fast. There will never be a need for hip replacement surgery or knee replacement surgery. Our bodies will last forever. Sometimes people wonder if we'll recognize each other in heaven. This parable indicates that we will. The rich man recognized Lazarus. Lazarus and Abraham both recognized the rich man. The disciples recognized Jesus in his resurrected body. We will recognize each other. And you know, for some of you, your life is in a season of great pain right now. Maybe it's physically, maybe it's emotionally, maybe it's financially. Maybe it's spiritually. And you need to remember that if you belong to God, you have the hope of where you're headed, the hope of a place with no tears, with no pain, no death. Do you remember the spirituals the slaves would sing in the cotton fields when they were being abused and underpaid and starved and worked until they dropped dead? Songs like, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, Coming For to Carry Me Home. I look over Jordan and what do I see? A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. And we read in the history books that often it was these songs, singing these songs that kept hope alive, kept these slaves alive, the hope of heaven. For those who experience heaven, there will be nothing but tremendous gratitude for the God who sent his son to save them, for the God who prepared an indescribable home for them, for the God who is worthy of our worship and gratitude forever and ever. All right, so just moments after you die, you will be wide awake, and you will be either filled with tremendous gratitude or enormous regret. And the third point we learn from this parable is you will be able to reflect back on your life with great clarity. Just minutes after you die, you will have great clarity on what mattered most in life. Look at verses 27 and 28. Just minutes after this rich man died, he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. There was like an urgency in his voice. For the first time in the story, this rich man shows that he's interested in someone other than himself. Just a few minutes in hell turned this non-believer into an evangelist. He, sends some, he says, someone's got to tell my brothers that hell is real. And that real people go here. Pull out all the stops. Do whatever it is that you need to do to let my brothers know that they don't want to come to this place. I don't know about you, but that scene gives me perspective on what really matters in this life. In life, this rich man didn't care about anyone but himself. Just moments after he died, he was crystal clear on what matters most. And it wasn't his wealth. It wasn't his house. It wasn't his portfolio. It wasn't his business deals. It wasn't his cars. It was one thing, people. That was the only thing that mattered because that's the only thing that lasts forever. 
And if at that point this guy could go back and do things differently, I think he would have done a lot of things differently. I think he would be generous. He would share with people outside of his gates who had physical needs and who had emotional and relational needs and who had spiritual needs like his brothers. You know, every time you invest yourself in a person, you invest in something that matters for eternity. Every meal, every gift, every note you write, every cup of cold water offered to someone who needs it is like building up your heavenly portfolio. You're building treasures in heaven, and God is pleased. But there's something else that's crystal clear from this parable, and that is it's not enough just to meet the physical needs of someone. What good is it to meet their physical needs and neglect their spiritual needs? Like the rich man in this parable, all of us know people who are unprepared for the other side. And there are thousands and thousands of people within driving distance of this church who are unprepared for the other side. You know, it's great that we collect food like we're doing today for the hungry. I love to be a part of a church that's generous and does things like that. But what good is it if we only feed hungry people? Or we put back together a broken life, but we don't also offer the hope that the only forgiver can save their soul and give them real life in all its fullness here and now and in the life to come. You know, I have something I want to address with those of you who call Blue Oaks your home church. I hear some people say about Blue Oaks, I like it here because it's not too big. Uh, And whenever I hear someone say that, I immediately think, does that mean that you're going to go somewhere else when we get too big? Whatever that means. Uh, Think of this rich man in hell pleading for someone to go share with his five brothers. Think about that. And I need you to hear me say this. Blue Oaks will never be too big. I mean, we could be a church of 10,000 people and we would not be too big. I'll tell you what's too big. Hell is too big. And too many people are on their way there. You know, sometimes churches, they say, we're not interested in quantity. We're just interested in quality. And I want to ask, aren't they both important? Weren't they both important to Jesus? You know, if my wife Kathy and I were headed out of town on a trip and I say to her, honey, uh, I could only find one of our kids, but it's a quality kid. (laughs) Do you think she's going to be satisfied with that? No, she's not, because when it comes to our kids, we are interested in quality and we are interested in quantity. And our Heavenly Father is interested in His kids in quantity as well as quality. Blue Oaks could never be too big. I mean, think about this rich man. He would want a place like Blue Oaks to be just five people bigger, wouldn't he? Hell is too big. And just a few minutes on the other side, and it's going to be crystal clear to all of us. Sometimes I wonder if a few minutes after I die, I won't say to myself, man, I wish I would have given more. I wish I would have prayed more. I wish I would have shared my faith a little more. I don't know if you've seen the movie, the Steven Spielberg movie, Schindler's List. If you have, you remember the moving final scene where Oscar Schindler, the Polish businessman who used a portion of his fortune to put the names of Jews on a work list that would keep them from going from, to uh, concentration camps. I mean, these were human beings who escaped death because of his action. And he looks into their faces and he has this moment of clarity. And he sees things as he's never seen them before. And he's talking to his friend and he says, if only I could have done more. If only I could have done more. And his friend says, you know, there are 1,100 people here. There are generations here because of what you've done. But Schindler says, it could have been more. That car, I could have sold that car and that would have meant 10 more people, 10 more people on that list, 10 more people saved. He rips the swastika pin from his coat and he says, this pin, it's gold, that's two people. At least one person could have been saved with this pin. He had a moment of clarity when he realized the difference between what we value on this earth and what we value in eternity. And I pray that we all have those moments of clarity. Well, I've tried to be as honest and as straightforward with you as possible about what happens after you die. And my sense today is that many of us are in one of a few places right now. Maybe this message has left some of you feeling like you have some issues that you need to get straightened out. Issues that this man in this parable didn't get straightened out. It's just so much clearer to you about what's going to happen on the other side and what really matters. Or maybe this message has left you realizing you have some soul issues to get right. 
I guarantee you that you won't be dead five seconds and one of two things will be true of you. You will either be deeply regretful that you didn't enter a relationship with Jesus Christ when you had the chance. Or you will look back and you will say that receiving Jesus Christ into your life was the best decision you've ever made. Just moments on the other side, it's going to be very clear to us. Have you settled that issue? Have you settled that in your heart and in your mind? And I believe God has brought some of you here today to give you that opportunity. Some of you have the sense that maybe God is drawing you or God is urging you or God is speaking to you. He's calling you. You know, some of you are here this morning, and I know this is your first time here, and you've just started exploring Christianity, and you need to know more. You're, just, you're not ready to make a decision like this. And I want to encourage you to keep coming and keep learning. Ask God to help you to show you the way. Would you consider giving God a chance in your life? Commit to being here for this Stories That Stick teaching series and see what God does in your life. Open up your heart and open up your mind to the teachings of Christ. Open up your life to Christ and see what he does. Read The Case for Faith by Lee Strobel. Again, we have copies at our new guest area. We'd love to give you one for free. I want to close with this for those of you who feel like maybe God is speaking to you. You know, we all have this picture in our minds of waiting in this long line that leads to the pearly gates where we meet up with St. Peter. And he has this book. And it's a book that has all the bad things that we've ever done and all the good things that we've ever done. And if we've done more good than bad and somehow it, you know, it balances out right, he's going to say, you can come in. And so we move forward in the line and we get more and more nervous hoping that we'll make it in. Well, that's a wrong picture. The Bible says that heaven is a perfect place. And because it's a perfect place, even one imperfection will keep us out. If you have one bad thought, one wrong decision, one sin in your life, that's enough to keep you out of heaven. And that means I don't stand a chance in a million of getting into heaven on my own, and neither do you. So that's why God came up with another plan. He sent us a Savior. Someone needed to remove the imperfections in my life so that I could go to heaven and be with him. And that's what Jesus did. That's why Jesus came to this earth. That's why he died on a cross, to remove the imperfections, to forgive us. That's why we celebrate Easter. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ with your life, I can't think of a better thing for you to do today. So just say to him, God, I trust you as the way to heaven. Just tell him. And I'd like to close in prayer. And if you're willing to let the reality of heaven and hell impact your life in a motivating, life-giving, strengthening way today, I just want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, first of all, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to tell me the good news, that you love me and that you want to welcome me into your heaven, your home, one day. I believe you are who you say you are, and I believe that you came to give me life in all its fullness. I believe there is nothing that I can do to free me from my sin or the consequences of my sin, which would be hell. You paid that price through Jesus' death on the cross to set me free from sin and from hell. And God, now for the rest of my life, for whatever time remains between now and the day I die, I give you my life. I give you my heart and my mind and my job and my possessions and my family and my behavior, everything. I don't hold anything back. I trust there will come a day when you remove every suffering and when you make right every injustice and when you multiply every joy. And God, I look forward to the promise of heaven. And God, I want to live for that which lasts. And I look forward to this because of the hope that I have through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I just want you to know you can be sure that just moments after you die, you will be filled with tremendous gratitude. You can be sure. In 1 John 5, verse 13, it says this, I write these things to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. You can know. And if you made that decision today, will you let us know by checking that box on your next step card? We just want to pray for you as you begin this next season uh, in your spiritual life. Also, the next best step for you would be to sign up for our starting point group. 
Uh, starting point is for those people who are either new to the faith or exploring uh, Christianity. And if you want more about start, want to know more about starting point, just let us know by checking that on your next step card. All right, now the ushers are going to come forward to receive the offering, and the band is going to play uh, one last song.